Hello students, so after you have gone through your uh, the chapter on gastritis, today we are here to discuss uh, peptic ulcer disease. So starting with the epidemiology, peptic ulcers are present in around 4% of the population and these are the data from 2015. You see that around 87.4 million people worldwide, uh, you get new ulcers. And about 10% of people develop a peptic ulcer at some point in their life. And the first description of a perforated peptic ulcer was in 1670, way back in 1670 in Princess Henry Tower of England. Now, how do you define peptic ulcer? Now, this is important. Uh, by definition, it is a circumscribed ulceration of the gastrointestinal mucosa occurring in areas exposed to acid and pepsin and most often caused by Helicobacter pylori infection. This was the definition put forward by Uphold and Graham in 2003. Now here you must remember one thing that this lesion must breach the muscularis mucosa. Now if you remember the layers of the mucosa, the first layer in the mucosa is the epithelium followed by the lamina propria and then the muscularis mucosa. So to call it an ulcer, it has to breach the muscularis mucosa. That means it has to reach the entire thickness of the mucosa and reach the submucosa, then only you can call it an ulcer. Now, if it does not reach the muscularis mucosa, you call it something else. Now, you, you would tell me in my next presentation or in my uh, WhatsApp group somewhere, anywhere, you would tell me what will you call a lesion which, which uh, does not reach the muscularis mucosa. Coming to the common locations of peptic ulcers, most commonly it is found in the first part of dornum, followed by antrum of stomach, where you commonly uh, get the H. pylori organisms. Then in esophagus, in the setting of Barrett's esophagus, in the margins of gastrointestinal then in Meckel's diverticulum, and anywhere in stomach to jejunum in zollinger ellison syndrome. Uh, now, if you look here in, uh, in the picture to your left, you see at the bottom, this is the uh, endoscope which has gone up to the stomach. So this is the endoscopic picture of a gastric ulcer. And here to the right, you see the endoscope has gone up to the first part of dornum. So this picture on the right is that of a dornal ulcer. Now coming to the etopathogenesis, as you know, there are some aggressive factors in the mm, stomach and there are some defensive factors too. Now, what are the aggressive factors which uh, lead to the formation of uh, ulcer? These are Helicobacter pylori itself, then these NSAIDs, then alcohol, steroids, stress, acid and pepsin. Now, please remember to call these NSAIDs and not NSAIDs. Okay. And I hope you remember, you know the full form of these NSAIDs. Then coming to defensive factor, the defensive factors are the mucus layer, the bicarbonates, the mucosal blood flow, the prostaglandins, and the process of epithelial cell renewal. So any imbalance between these aggressive factors and the defensive factors would lead to the development of peptic ulcer disease. Now, in both types of peptic ulceration, be it gastric or journal, there is an imbalance between the secretion of the acid and the neutralization of the secreted acid. Now, this picture is from your book, Robbins, where you see the damaging forces like gastric acidity peptic enzymes, and these are the defensive forces, as I have already told you. Now, wherever there is increase in the damaging forces or there is some impairment of the defensive forces, there is formation of this ulceration. Now, this is a very interesting picture and one of my favorites where you see that how Helicobacter pylori causes the damage. You see, as I have told you in my previous PPT on gastritis that Helicobacter pylori generally infests the mucus layer of the epithelium. Now, here the organism will come and it will elaborate the enzyme urease. Now, urease would split urea. It will actually hydrolyze urea and it will form carbon dioxide and ammonia. 
Now where will this urea come from? It will come from your food that you are taking in. So urea from food would be hydrolyzed to ammonia and carbon dioxide and this ammonia being alkaline would neutralize the gastric acid just in the vicinity of the organism so that it will help the organism to survive in the gastric acidic environment. Similarly, other bacilli would also come in and infest the epithelium and by virtue of its antigenic factors like those um, adhesion, adhesion molecules and those like hydrotoxic factors like AGA and BAC A, there will be inflammation, there will be mucosal cell death and ultimately formation of an ulcer. Now what are the signs and symptoms of peptic ulcer disease? Most commonly a burning sensation in the stomach or epigastro. Um, very common in Bengalis, they complain of pet chala. Mm -hmm. So that is very common and followed by vomiting, blood in the vomitus which is also called hematemesis and a bloated abdomen, a feeling of fullness in the abdomen. So the most common um, symptom would be burning or aching epigastric pain in the stomach followed by nausea, vomiting, hematemesis, bloated abdomen, belching, burping and dyspepsia. I hope you all know what is what dyspepsia is. If not, let me know in the WhatsApp. Now coming to the morphology of peptic ulcers. Now they are usually solitary and uh, if you look at the picture, it will be easier, easier for me to describe. Now look at this picture. So these are see round to oval, sharply punched out defect. Now look at the base. Base of the ulcer is smooth and clean and a blood vessel. I do not know whether you can appreciate there is a small blood vessel here which may be evident and these are the gastric rugal folds. You can see the gastric rugal folds which can be traced up to the margin of the ulcer. Now why is this morph gross morphology important? Because you have to differentiate this ulcer which is benign from a malignant ulcer of gastric carcinoma. Now, here as a pathology student you would have to differentiate it in a pathology specimen kept in museum jars but once you come out as uh, doctors you become surgeons you become a clinician suppose you open up an ab abdomen in a patient when you are a surgeon and you are uh, on the operation table you are looking at a ulcer in the stomach and you have to differentiate whether the ulcer is benign or malignant, these features are important. Now the ultimate job would be of a pathologist to tell you whether the ulcer is benign or malignant but of course as a clinician you have to have a clinical bent of mind to know whether the ulcer is benign or malignant. So how, how would it have been if it, it would have been a malignant ulcer? The margins would, wouldn't have been so regular, the margins would have been irregular, the base would have been filled with necrotic debris, not clean. And these gastric rugal folds wouldn't have been up to the margin of the ulcer. You couldn't have traced these margin, gastric rugal folds up to the margin of the ulcer. They would have been lost somewhere in the, somewhere in between only. So you couldn't have traced these gastric rugal folds up to the margin of the ulcer. So the margins would have been irregular, base would have been uh, unclean, I mean filled with necrotic debris and the gastric rugal folds wouldn't have been traced up to the margin of the ulcer. So this is how you differentiate between a benign ulcer and a malignant ulcer and um, usually benign ulcers are smaller in size and malignant ulcers are larger in size but not always. Microscopically you usually have four zones that topmost zone of necrotic debris, then followed by a non-specific inflammation, then a granulation tissue zone here and the lowermost zone of fibrous scarring, fibrous tissue. This picture is also from your book Robbins. What are the complications of peptic ulcer disease? The most common complication is a perforated peptic ulcer. Now it may perforate or it may penetrate into the neighboring surrounding organs like pancreas, liver, into the retroperitoneal space. Okay. Now once it perforates and 
uh, throws out its contents into the peritoneal space, what will happen? That uh, the contents would be foreign to the peritoneal space, so it will incite a inflammatory an inflammatory reaction in the peritoneal space, so leading to peritonitis. If the if the ulcer persists for a very long time, it would it would uh, lead to uh, fibrous uh, tissue formation, scarring, and ultimately constriction of the um, bowel, leading to bowel obstruction, gastric outflow obstruction, and pyloric stenosis also. Bleeding can occur in 25 to 35 percent of the cases, and it is it also accounts for 25 percent of the mortalities. And finally, it may also lead to malignancies, most commonly gastric adenocarcinoma. How would you diagnose? Now, diagnosis is mainly through upper GI endoscopy, as you commonly call it, or you also call it in a medical term, it is esophagogastrodornoscopy because is it the door the scope it enters the esophagus, passes through the stomach, and enters the first part of dorno. So that is why it is called esophago gastro dorno scope. So that is upper GI endoscopy. That is how you uh, uh, look into the whole tract up to the first part of dorno to look for any presence of any ulcer. And then you do all the tests for helicobacter pylori that I have already mentioned in my previous PPT. Now, usually, uh, if you are uh, sure on endoscopy uh, that the ulcer is benign, you do usually do not do a um, biopsy, or you just give a treatment for helicobacter pylori and see whether the patient is responding to the treatment. And if the patient responds, if the ulcer heals, that means it was a benign ulcer, and you do not do a biopsy. But suppose you treat the patient and the patient is not responding to treatment or if the endoscopic appearance is suspicious, then probably you take a biopsy from the ulcer and do a histopathology. So that can be a third tool for diagnosis, but not always. So that was all regarding peptic ulcer disease. Now what do I want? What I would want you to do is there are some specific differences clinically between a mm, gastric ulcer and a duodenal ulcer because peptic ulcer disease consists of mainly these two ulcers, a gastric ulcer and a duodenal ulcer. Now, there are some clinical points of difference between the pain in gastric ulcer and the pain in duodenal ulcer. So, what you would do is you, it's already it's there in your book. So, just find out the differences in the clinical differences between the um, pain in gastric ulcer and pain in donor ulcer and let me know. Okay. So thank you for today. I hope you have uh, gained from this presentation at least something. Thank you.